Give him glory. Give him honor. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. So good to see you with us this morning. We're excited to have you here on this first Sunday of April. And uh, I'm excited about it. And I did a little calculation just a little bit earlier. And uh, according to my calculations, we have taken in the Children's Cup offering on the first Sunday of the three months that we have had so far, $725, right? So all of these funds go to Children's Cup, the ministry working there on the ground in Belize uh, with the children, in, mainly in the community of Orange Walk up near the Mexican border. And uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. So we're going to do this again this morning. And uh, Mr. Terrence is ready. And boys and girls, you got your cup ready. And uh, we're going to do the Children's Cup offering. And uh, hey, if you got change, dollars, checks, credit cards, well, I mean, no, we don't want to use those. But uh, I want you to just wave your hand out. These boys and girls are going to help you. Come on, boys and girls. All the boys and girls, come on. Uh, you got your cups. Let's get ready. Um, all right. Fill the boys' bucket up. Okay? Look. Clinton, could you not get her to the boys' bucket? <laughs> All right. All right. Give the boys and girls a hand. All right. Okay, we'll let the boys and girls go to Children's Church, nine and under. Uh, nine and under to Children's Church, if you will. The, the ladies and gentlemen are in the back, and they'll lead you to Children's Church. And come on, give the boys and girls a hand. They've done a good job. <clears throat> And I want to see these boys and girls grow up to be missionaries, and we'll take them to Belize, okay? And let them be on the ground, feet on the ground, seeing what God is doing and that they've had a part in uh, all of these years. And that, that is exciting that we can do that. And I appreciate you so much for supporting our children during this time and help them. If you've got children uh, that are participating in this, make sure that they understand what they're doing. We're more, doing more than trying to fill a bucket. All right? So make sure that they understand what we're doing. We're ministering to children in other parts of the world that do not have it as well as our children do. All right? So, all right, we are in week one of 
let me get you to do the connect card first, okay? I'm jumping track here. You'll find the connect card in front of you. Uh, if you're watching online, they're sharing with this with you online, but if you're in the house, there's a card just in front of you. If you will complete the card, uh, connect with us. Also, put your prayer needs on here because our prayer team is going to come along with you this afternoon and begin praying with you for your needs, whatever it is that's weighing you down, whatever it was that kept you up last night, we'd love to pray about that throughout the week with you. So put your prayer needs on this card. The ushers are going to come by in a little bit, and uh, you can drop it in the back when they come by. If you don't have it finished by the time they come by, they'll be standing at the door on your way out, and you can drop it in the bag then. So we have our Saturday morning prayer meetings and these cards are one of the focuses of our Saturday morning prayer meetings at 9 o'clock. And yesterday morning, something I saw so beautiful is before the prayer meeting ever started, I saw them walking along the altar here, praying over these cards one by one. So if you want your prayer, if you want your needs prayed over, make sure you have it on these cards. We'd love to ask you to come and pray with us the next Saturday. I know next Saturday is a very busy day because it is the day before Easter, and you got to make sure you got everything ready for Easter. A perfect way to get that started would be at 9 o'clock here in the sanctuary, praying with your brothers and sisters and churches around the world, literally, praying at the very same time uh, for a move of God and praying for the needs that have been noticed uh, today that we put on the cards and praying for the service. So yesterday morning, there was somebody praying for you here in this service yesterday, in this building yesterday morning. So I want you to know that you've already been prayed for today once already. The Connect cards are there. The offering envelopes are there. We'll get the ushers by in just a moment. All right, today being the first Sunday of the month, we're doing growth track in this, the fellowship hall. Uh, we did not do it last week because of the weather and other things. So today we will be going into the fellowship hall. If you want to become a member of Life Church, or if you and or if you want to be a part of the ministry teams here at Life Church, we invite you to go into the fellowship hall with us immediately following this service. So when we dismiss and we go out the door, you just take a left and go into that room, and we'll meet you in there, and uh, we'll give you the information that you need and help you find your place in the ministry of the church here at Life Church. And we want you to uh, take that seriously because we believe something's up. Amen? We believe God is doing something and about to do even greater things. We're still meeting in small groups on Wednesday nights here at 630. And uh, we invite you to come and be a part of this. This is mainly a time for fellowship, a time for connection and uh, we invite you to come and be a part of that as well, 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Then uh, this coming Saturday, I was, how am I going to put this? I was fussed at. <laughs> Trying to find a, a nice way to put this. Last Sunday for not mentioning the candy for the Easter egg hunt. This coming Saturday is the Easter egg hunt. All the children uh, are invited to come and be a part of that. If it rains, we will have it in the fellowship hall in the same room we do growth track. It'll look a little bit different, but uh, we invite you uh, to come on and bring your children next, sun, uh, next Saturday morning. At what time is that? Uh, two o'clock, Saturday afternoon. <laughs> so I didn't do my homework. So um, we invite you to bring your children, grandchildren, grandma's grandchildren, bring them all. And we need candy for that, and you can bring that here by Wednesday night, if you've not already done so, because your pastor didn't announce that last week, uh, nor the week before, but we need candy for the uh, Easter egg hunt. So next Saturday, make sure you have the children here, but Wednesday night, by Wednesday night, we need the candy uh, that you want to donate to help go with the party, okay? So is that clear as mud? Okay, I want to make sure of that. Uh, sometimes, and I saw Easter egg hunt for three or four weeks on there, but for some reason didn't announce it properly. So, uh, you know that now, okay? All right, we'll ask our ushers if they will come. We want to give you an opportunity this morning as gi to give as giving to the Lord, and uh, we'll ask our ushers to come, and they're coming. All right, 
bow your heads with us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on us. Thank you for this Easter season. Thank you for giving us a reason to celebrate. Thank you, Lord, for all you've blessed us with this past week, keeping your hands on us and bringing us to this point. I pray now, Lord, that as we come to bring back to you a portion of that that you've given us, I pray that you take it, use it for your glory here in this building, but not only here, but throughout the ministries that we participate in that reach around the world. I pray, God, that you would just use it for that, meet every need of every heart and every life here today. Those that do not have to give, I pray that you will bless them with a job, with income, that they too can take part in the principles of giving. Bless those that do have to give today as they give freely. Bless in the remaining part of this service. Let your will be done here in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Okay, for the whole month of March, we preached on life in Babylon, referring to the book of Daniel, and uh, I hope you got a deeper appreciation for Daniel today than you did even before that, but we're not quite done with Daniel, and you say, but pastor, this is Palm Sunday, so we're supposed to be over in the New Testament. But there is a connection, and for several weeks now, the Lord has been dealing with my heart about this, and I want us to, to dig into Scripture. We've got quite a bit of Scripture this morning that we're going to cover, and just because your pastor loves you more than he can tell you, all of the Scripture is already in the notes that you've been given as you came in the building. What I want you to do with those is not necessarily pay a lot of attention uh, to all of that this morning as much as take it home with you so that you can go back and do a little deeper study in this because there's a lot in these scriptures that I believe God will speak to your heart about today, okay? And throughout the week, if you will let him. So what I want to talk to you about this morning is the humility of the cloud rider. What does that got to do with Palm Sunday? I'm so glad you asked. The humility of the cloud rider. So... Let's just go and look at one prepared for the Grand Parade. You know what a parade is? Everybody likes a parade. Uh, I don't particularly (laughs) like parades, but they have all of the big hoopla over the parades. So let's, let's look at this parade. Daniel, as we've spoken about so many times, Daniel and his three Hebrew buddies and others were in Babylon as captives, as slaves, but Daniel and his friends, they kind of hit it off pretty good because they were doing very well in ministering to the king and to the kingdom of the people. And we talked last week about Daniel and his prayer time and his constant time of praying even when he was told not to pray. He went to the lion's den. You remember the story. That's what we preached last week, and we're not going to go back and do that. But as we move a little farther over into Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel has done a lot of fasting. Daniel has done a lot of praying. And now all of a sudden, Daniel is seeing something We've, we, we've heard a lot of what Nebuchadnezzar saw and then what Belshazzar saw on the wall, but 
Daniel is seeing something, and I want you, this is a vision. Okay, where God is showing Daniel something, and and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning, but there's something I want us to pull from what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. Daniel said, as I looked into the vision, he's watching, he said, thrones were placed. There's a whole lot of theology in those three words, and I'm not going to spend the day there. If you did the supernatural study with us a couple of years ago, this stands out to you probably. But he said, thrones were placed, and the ancient of days took his seat. So let's get this in our mind. If you can pull together a vision here of what Daniel is seeing, he's seeing thrones that were put in place, and the ancient of days... We know who that is, right? Look at how it is described. The Ancient of Days took his seat. God took his seat. Look what he says. God's clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Interesting in the description. And then he said, A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. How many angels are there? Right? A thousand thousands served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's a crowd. Daniel sees a crowd. And and I don't think Daniel numbered these, but he was probably giving a really good guesstimation there. But thousands upon thousands were serving before the throne of God. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. This sounds like Revelation, doesn't it? But it's actually Daniel, way back when he was in Babylon, long before Christ ever came to this earth. Then let's jump to verse 13. Daniel said, And I saw in the night vision, and behold, and this next statement is what I want you to latch on to this morning, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. That makes chills go all over me. Daniel said, I saw in the clouds of heaven one like the Son of Man. Have we gotten that far yet? Are we hung up on the scripture? Verse 13. Okay. With the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days. So do you see two there? Right? God sitting on the throne and the one like the Son of Man coming to him and was presented before him. Who is this Son of Man? Look at what he says in verse 14. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Who does that sound like? That all peoples Nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall never be destroyed or that shall not be destroyed. Who does it sound like? Jesus Christ. So way back when Daniel was in Babylon, he saw Jesus in the clouds. On the clouds. So go back and look at verse 13 where it says, with the clouds of heaven. That's what I want you to focus on. The clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So here is the parade that Daniel has seen as they're coming toward the throne of God. So then let's go to the next point, the humility of the king of peace. So we've got Jesus, we know being a cloud rider, riding the cloud, right? 
Okay, the humility of the king of peace. Let's look in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, Daniel saw him riding on clouds. But Zechariah says he's going to come to you riding on a donkey. In a, a quick little interpretation here is he's going to humble himself and come down to our level. You see that? Can you imagine what that must have been like? To leave the clouds and beyond and come to planted earth and live as a human being, son of man, son of God, son of man. Here on planted earth, you see the humility there? So let's go to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. This is the where you get the Palm, story, Palm Sunday story. Most of the cloud spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So what is about to happen is the prophecy that Zechariah just gave, and it's about to be fulfilled. Verse 9, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Daniel did not see him coming on a donkey. Daniel saw him on a cloud, but Zechariah saw him on a donkey. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred saying, who is it? Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is Jesus. The cloud rider humbled himself to become a man, a man like you and me, riding on a donkey. Donkeys were not as, that was not as uncommon as a lot of people may think because a lot of the kings would come riding in on donkeys or uh, on smaller colts. The stallions were for war, but the donkeys were more for something of this nature. So Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. If you can imagine that day when the people recognized that this miracle-working, powerful, speaking man was coming into their town, they took the palm branches, they broke them, they, be they began singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What we see is Jesus had gained a following of people that were probably known as disciples, uh, believers, uh, followers, and then a lot of spectators as well, which is different than a follower, if you know what I mean. So what we see is happening here is that Jesus Christ, who was king of kings and will be king of kings and lord of lords, was brought down to ride on a donkey instead of the clouds. N.T. Wright has said that within his own time and culture, Jesus riding on a donkey over the Mount of Olives across the Kidron and up to the Temple Mount spoke more powerfully than words could have done of a royal claim. The allusion to Zechariah's prophecy is obvious. The so-called triumphal entry was thus clearly messianic, saying that this man riding on this donkey is the Christ. They recognize that, but the cloud rider is on a donkey, on the back of a donkey. I just hope that you can understand this the way I feel that God is wanting us to this morning. I'm hoping I can get this across. 
But then there was a proclamation followed this that stirred the religious crowd. So you know those opponents of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how they felt when they're hearing the people singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're taking their palm branches and they're putting there for him and, and taking their cloaks and put them on the ground so the donkey can walk across them and because they're recognizing Jesus Christ as king of kings or as a king. And then we know how the story progresses and how he is arrested and then finally gets before the, the big dogs, the high priests. So pause that for just a moment and we think back to the Old Testament of how that God had called the priest, right? You go back and you look in Exodus and, and Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you see all of this where the high priest is very active, right? Aaron, the sons of Aaron, right? You see all of this, the high priest that was working there. Well, Jesus in the New Testament now has been brought before the high priest. So what we have is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the cloud rider, who humbled himself, is now arrested and is being tried by the, first of all, by the church, by, let me, not the church, the church wasn't born to lax, let's say the religious community. You know there's a difference, don't you? You, you understand there's a difference in the religious community and the church. All right, there's a lot of religious people. Look in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 59. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. So you got the religious people that's trying to figure out how can we legally kill him. Okay, that's basically what that sentence is saying. But they found none. They couldn't find a reason whatsoever. Though many false witnesses came forward, and at last two came forward and said, one of them said, this man that you're trying, he said, we heard him say with his own lips, with our ears, we heard him say, I am able to destroy the temple. Well, that automatically stirred up all of the religious people because that's where we collect our money. That's where we gather for the priest and the high priest. This is their place. And the temple is, you know, obviously the place of worship because we saw that from Solomon. And then the rebuilding of the temples that we've seen in the Old Testament happening in here. Jesus has said, I'm able to tear the temple down and to rebuild it in three days. But that's not the temple he's talking about. But the religious people takes it as you're going to tear our house up. So they're bringing those accusations against Jesus. And notice the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, imagine this in your mind with you, with me. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, so what are you going to say? Have you no answer to make? Did you say you're going to tear the temple down in three days and build it back, or tear it down and then build it back in three days? Notice the difference in the carnality and the spiritual. Jesus wasn't talking about a physical building. The, he wasn't talking about the temple that they're worshiping in. He's talking about himself. And here, they're taking this to be more physical in the sense of the building. In verse 62, the high priest stood up. Now, this is the top dog, if you will, and uh, I, I don't mean that. This is the high priest. Okay, let me just say that. He stood up and he said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. I have a problem doing that. Some of you do as well. But I have a problem in remaining silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. 
silence fills the room as they wait. You ready for it? Silence fills the building much like it is right here now with you waiting to see what I'm going to say next. And Jesus standing there. The high priest is angry. The priest is angry. The whole group is angry. Jesus had remained silent. Up until this point, verse 64, Jesus said to them, you have said so. But that's not what I want to preach. Look at this. Jesus said, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power. And this next part is what you need to see. Coming on the clouds of heaven. For you see this group of people he's talking to, they know Daniel's prophecy. They know that Daniel said that he saw. I'm going to go back and do this again. He said, Daniel said, and, and these people know what Daniel has said. Daniel said back up in uh, Daniel 7, 9, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took their seat, his clothing as white as snow, his hair and his head like pure wool, his throne as a fiery flame, his wheels like burning fire. Then go down to verse 13. He said, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man. And now Jesus is telling this religious community that knows that prophecy so well. I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man. That's what Daniel said that looked like that came to the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. Jesus said, you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Have you ever played with gasoline? Have you ever, he confessed right quickly there. Have you ever poured gas on something and then stuck a match to it? You know what happened. That's what happened in this group. When Jesus said to them that what I'm going to say to you is from now on, you're going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God, a power, and coming in the clouds of heaven because all of a sudden this group took Jesus as saying, yes, I am the one that you're accusing me of being. I am the one. I am the cloud rider. But what was he doing on a donkey? What was he doing on a donkey? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, who has been seen throughout the Old Testament, and I can't get them all, can't name them all this morning, but he now stands before this religious community. Look at what happened. The high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Because he has blasphemed. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Religious Man. You are fulfilling prophecy in your own words. We know the story. We know how that they've taken Jesus. They take Jesus and they beat him with what we know as the cat of nine tails. The whip that actually... Uh, as they tell us, had uh, one long strip, and then at the end of it, several strips coming out of it, as many as nine perhaps, and then intertwined within that uh, whip, those, those nine branches of that whip that would come out would have bones and glass and things of that nature in that they would beat the prisoners with. They took this and they beat Jesus with this. Thirty-nine stripes. But he's the cloud rider that Daniel saw. He said, I see him coming on the clouds. Yeah. 
Nathanael said and was given to him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion will is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. But they're beating him. It doesn't even sound like the same man, right? It doesn't even sound like the same man that Daniel saw, that Zechariah saw, that, that we see now. This says that you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. But yet right now he's being beaten by big soldiers ripping and tearing his body. They take him and they have a cross where, and, and I'm going to tell you what, you missed the prayer meeting yesterday morning, I'm sorry, because it was a beautiful story of how that Jesus Christ took Barabbas' place. That, that's a powerful thought right there, but Barabbas was supposed to have been crucified, but instead they chose Jesus instead of Barabbas, and all of it was a part of fulfilling the prophecy. But then they've taken Jesus with his body beaten. They take him and they nail him to the cross. Before that, they ask him to drag his cross out to Golgotha. You know the story how he falls beneath the cross and then is... Another carries a cross. He goes to Golgotha, and they've got him laying there on this cross, if you can imagine this. And it's not just little nails. They're not just hacking him, but they are using spikes to drive through his hands or his wrists, perhaps, nailing him to the cross. And in his feet, they're nailing his feet to the cross and do you know how it feels when you, when you get a, a briar or when you get a, a sticker or something in your skin and how it just aggravates you or you get a cut? And, and then they raised the cross up between heaven and earth and it falls. Have you ever built a fence? Have you ever put up a corner post? The corner post is the big uh, Chris old post that you put on the corner of the field and you dig this post hole. I've done this before. I, as a matter of fact, it was one of my first jobs ever is digging post hole for 10 cents a hole. Lord help us. But they, we, they, they dug this big hole and they, we would, to put the corner post up, we would raise this post up because we were little weakling boys. So we had the big hole and we'd raise that post hole like a Chris old post. We'd raise it up, and when it would go into that hole, it would. Except on this cross, hung the cloud rider. As they raise the cross between heaven and earth, and as they raise it up and it comes aligned with that hole, it thumps as it hits the bottom of that hole. Imagine tearing the body of our Lord, the cloud rider. They mock him. They gamble for his clothes. They make fun of him. We know the story of the thieves in the conversation there, and I'm not going to go through that this morning, but what we see is between heaven and earth, hanging on an old rugged cross, Jesus Christ, totally humiliated before the world. They gambled for his clothes. He had a few followers standing over there weeping and bawling and probably some even hysterical. The crowd, they were the soldiers gambling for his clothes. They were waiting for him to die to make sure that he was dead. They were checking, and instead of breaking his bone, they're fulfilling prophecy. They poke the spear into his side, and out flows water and blood. The most gruesome sight, the most terrible thought that one could even have of any human being. 
very home. And he said the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then he said, it is finished. It is finished. There's no more humiliation. Past this. Jesus told the disciples something that I don't think that they even understood when he said, those that humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus Christ in full humiliation, hanging on the cross, said, it is finished, it's over, it's done. We know the story, and we'll pick up on this next week, but we know the story of how they took his body down, wrapped it in grave clothes, and put it in the grave. He was only there three days. I hate to leave him there all week, but we know there was a resurrection, right? So, what's the point? What's the point? There's space in the bulletin note or on the, the sermon notes for you to write what you want to write. But what's the point of all this? What's the point of Jesus humbling himself in the way that he did? Obviously, he did that for you and me. He did this, and because of that humiliation that he went through, you and I can have life and have it more abundantly, right? You and I can know freedom from our sin, but you say, Pastor, you don't know what I did. No, but I read what Jesus did, right? I don't know what you did. I don't care to know what you did. Don't come telling me. You don't have to confess to me. But what I want you to know is that regardless of what you did, because of what Jesus did in total humiliation, he did it for you so that he could wash your sins away. And though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They'll be, they, they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We know Jesus Christ washed away our sins. But what's the point of all the humiliation? Jesus exemplified the, the path in which each one of us must take. But some of us sometimes ride on cloud nine thinking we're all that. There are people this week that will run over themselves and you too trying to find the perfect Easter outfit for next Sunday to celebrate Easter Sunday. They'll be walking in church doors all over this country so perfumed up, cologne up, it'll give you a headache. And they have looked at themselves in the mirror, and they think they are all of that and a bag of chips to go with it. And it's quite the opposite picture of what we see with the true picture of the crucifixion and resurrection. You must humble yourself before the Lord and realize that we are only what we are by the grace of God. What is it going to take to humble us? So you see, the beauty of it is we get the opportunity to humble ourselves before God. And that's why we are in the middle of three days of fasting and praying. And today's the day we pray for the church, as a matter of fact. But we don't like that idea. We don't like the idea. What the scripture tells us in several places to humble ourselves before God. We don't like to humble. We don't like to come down to planet earth. We like our high and mighty clouds. But he that exalteth himself is going to be brought down. If Jesus Christ, the son of God, the cloud rider who Daniel saw, must stumble himself to show us, for us, and then to show us how, then you and I must find the place of humility. 
before there can be a resurrection, there must be a death. And more than likely, a humiliating one. Though we must never forget that death is not the end. I don't care who you are. First of all, let's understand that you can humble yourself before God without God humbling you or humiliating you. But then there are times that we will walk through humiliation before we leave this life. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what kind of care you have. There are going to be things that come our way that's going to humiliate us. Each one of us must come down off of our high horse and humble ourselves. And sometimes, because we don't do that on our own, the Lord will bring us down. And you know, I want you to understand today, we must be people of humility, we must be people who realize that, yes, if Jesus Christ did this, we must do this as well. And here, we must humble ourselves before God and realize that if we don't, God has ways of humbling us. Paul says, I had a thorn in the flesh. I don't know what the thorn was, but Paul said, I have prayed over and over and over and over for God to remove this thorn, but it's still there. It will not leave. And he said, I prayed for God to remove it, and he didn't. But God did say that my grace is sufficient. Our humility and humiliating things that come our way, there's grace for those Russell Kelso Carter wrote a song. And I want you to listen to these words. And, and some of you know the song. Some of you that are as old as I am, you know this song. He said, I saw a blood-washed pilgrim, a sinner saved by grace, up on the king's great highway with peaceful shining face. Temptation sore beset him, but nothing could affright, he said, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. His helmet was salvation, a simple faith his shield, and righteousness his breastplate, the spirit's sword he had wielded. All fiery darts arrested and quenched their blazing flight. He cried, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. He said, I saw him in the furnace. He doubted not nor feared. And in the flames beside him, the Son of God appeared. Though seven times twas heated with all the tempter's might, he said, the yoke is easy and the burden it is light. Mid storms and clouds and trials, in prison at the stake, he leaped for joy, rejoicing twas all for Jesus' sake that God should count him worthy with such supreme delight. He cried, the yoke is easy and the burden is so light. I saw him overcoming through all the swelling strife until he crossed the threshold of God's eternal life. The crown, the thorn, the, the crown, the throne, the scepter, the name, the stone so white were his who found in Jesus the yoke and the burden light and oh. Palms of victory, crowns of glory. Palms of victory, I shall wear. Every, you, did you catch all of the things that went on in the verses of that song? It reminded me of the three Hebrew children we talked about just a few weeks ago, thrown into the fiery furnace. It reminded me of Daniel being thrown in the lion's den. But every one of them came out singing palms of victory. Right? Crowns of glory, palms of victory. Palms of victory I shall wear. You are going to go through humiliating times. It may be a lion's den. It may be a fiery furnace. It may be an incurable disease. It may be financial woe. It may be heartache. It may be brokenness. But each one of you are going to go through 
times of humiliation. But I'm not done. Child of God, you can make it through whatever you may be facing today or whatever you may face in days to come. Some of you this morning are going through trials. You're going through difficulties. You're going through struggles. But I want to carry you just a little farther in this message before we close. The cloud rider who humiliated himself. Notice this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, verse 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In that phrase right there, the dead in Christ, what I see in those three words is so much humiliation. When I think of how that the apostles of old were martyred for the sake of Christ. When I think of the men and women of God who loved God and served God so faithfully. And I think about the humiliation during their death. Those who died in Christ will rise first. Regardless of what kind of humiliating thing happens to us here on this earth. It's not the end. Are you with me this morning? Do you, do you see what's happening? Do you see where we're going? Regardless. What humiliating things you face in this life. There's something more to come. The dead in Christ shall rise first. But then look at the next verse. Then we who are alive, who are left. Okay, if you don't re remember anything that I've said from these scriptures up to this point, look at this. We will be caught up together with them where? Do you see that? Daniel said, I saw him coming with the clouds, one like the Son of Man. Jesus said, you're going to see the Son of Man coming with the clouds. Here, Paul is saying, those who died in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive and are left, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. You know what that tells me? That I'm going to ride a cloud, you're going to ride a cloud, we're going to ride clouds, right? Amen? We will, because we have gone through our times of humiliation here on planet Earth. You said, but pastor, I thought Christianity was going to be a bed of ease. Well, look around. All right. Amen. Anybody here have heartaches? Anybody here have struggles? Anybody had troubles this past week? There are times of humiliation. There are times of testing. There are times of trials. There are times of heartaches. But there will come a day when all of that will be over and it will be known as resurrection morning that Jesus Christ exemplified for us and our times of humiliation will soon be over. And look what he says. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Everybody said amen. amen. But look at what he says. So we will always be with the Lord. You say, preacher, I don't like that. I don't believe that. I don't believe in rapture. I believe in rapture. I don't, I don't, I'm not even getting into that. I don't care. If we go on the first load, if we go on the second load, I don't care when we go. The most important part of it all is that last phrase, so we will always be with the Lord. I don't care how I get there. 
I don't care what I have to go through to get there. I watched my daddy take his last breath after cancer had ravaged that body. But it's over now for him. It's over now for him. I've watched many people take their last breath. I've had many loved ones, and I was thinking this morning of how that just a few years back, Ann Wiggins was helping us with Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And then I remember her lying on that bed, that bed of humiliation, that bed of suffering. But today it is no longer because she has gone on to be with the Lord. We will see her again. I think about the pastor friends that I've had that have shared the gospel, that have sacrificed their life, that went to an ICU because of COVID and lost their lives just within the past couple of years, their time of humiliation is over. You know that's got to be humiliating when a preacher of God's word who's preached hellfire and brimstone, healing miracles and all of these things is lying on a hospital bed dying. You hear what I'm saying? What about the healer? What about divine healing? Dad's words still ring in my ears. Son, I thought I would be healed by now. Humiliation. Jesus walked that road for us. But what I want you to understand is humiliation is not the end. It is only the passageway to the resurrection. The only way we can have an Easter Sunday is have a week of humiliation. I pray that you don't have that, but that's what Jesus had. But Jesus, you're supposed to be riding clouds, Daniel said. But he walked that lonely road to Golgotha. Just so that I, if not for any other, but just because I needed a Savior. I was going to make more mistakes than I could even count, more than I could even keep up with. I was going to turn my back on Him so many times. I had to have a Savior. I didn't deserve life. I don't deserve being a pastor. I don't even deserve being called a Christian. There was no amount of money that could save me. I couldn't do enough good deeds to earn it. I can only stand here today because of what Jesus did in humiliating himself so that I could have life. Do you realize this morning if you're a believer in Christ, do you realize what you have and do you realize the cost of what you have? Do you realize the price that he paid? 
to where he came from, where he came to, just to get you. Right where you are with your head bowed. I just wonder. Would you be willing just to accept the fact that you can't do it on your own? And would you just be willing to accept the fact today that Jesus did it for you? I don't care what anyone has said. I don't care what anyone has told you that you have to do. Jesus said these words right here. That God so loved this world that He sent His only begotten Son. So that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I wonder this morning, how many could raise your hand and say, I'm a believer. Okay, put your hands down. I wonder how many in this building could say this morning, just by raising your hand, I've become a believer today. And I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ today. Because of what he did for me, I accept what he's given me. I want you to pray with me right where you are. Jesus, thank you for what you did for me so that I wouldn't die in my sins. Thank you for giving me a place at your family table with the children of God. Wash away my sins. Fill me with your holy presence. Help me to live day by day as a believer, seeking to please you in your need, your name. There would be some that would tell you that that's not enough prayer to get saved, but Jesus said, whoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You can make it. You can make it because of Jesus Christ and because of your faith in him. Today, if you surrender your life to Christ, I would like to know it on the Connect card. If you would make sure your name is on there, your phone number, and check that box that said, I committed my life to Jesus today. Or I renewed my commitment to Christ today. Because of what he did for me. I want you to stand with me. Everybody in the building, I want you to stand. Christ deserves to be praised. I want you to praise him this morning. On Palm Sunday, all of those years ago, there was a group of people that recognized this humble man was more 
than just a Galilean. He was a son of God. Let's worship him. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Oh, 
Don't you think we've got enough this morning to be praising him for? How many has, has test, can testify that he's brought me a long way through a whole lot? Say amen. And it's not over. I want to tell you what, this week I want you to just to fall in love with Jesus all over again. I woke up at... I woke up ridiculously early this morning, but I was sitting in my study around 6 o'clock listening to this song blaring over from YouTube and such a heavenly moment. This is a special week, okay? This is a special week. This is the week that Christians all over the world recognize what Jesus Christ has done for us. God let us remember it every day, but not just this week. But I want you to enjoy as a Christian. You got a lot to be excited about this week. So I want you to praise him and give him praise and blessings throughout the week, all right? Next week, I'm excited about next week, Easter Sunday. We will not have growth track next Sunday, but today we do. So if you want to go through growth track with us, when you go out that door, take a left and go into the fellowship hall with us. Uh, I will join you there in just a moment. I did wash my hands and clean up while you were worshiping, so uh, don't fear shaking my hand, all right? That's just a little disclaimer. Love you to death, all right? want you to have a great week. Father, I pray today that you will go with us and keep your hands on us. Strengthen this church, strengthen each individual, Lord. Lord, we don't know what today holds. We have no idea what we will face this week. But what we do know is that you've already shown us how we can overcome one day. God, we're going to celebrate with you in those clouds. And today we walk out of here with that in mind, knowing that soon and very soon we will see you. Go with us. Keep your hands on us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Bless you. Enjoy your day. May I never see you today that I don't rise to Hallelujah.